Greetings, everyone. I'm the delicious and mythical Griffin Muffin. Are video games art? It's a lofty question, and to me, it's irrevocably simple to answer. Yes, video games are art. Are they a mature art form? Eh, maybe not. Let's be real. The video game industry is relatively young compared to the other media. I once heard on a video by YouTuber Dan Olsen on his channel Folding Ideas a very thought-provoking line that has stuck with me for a few months now. It was when he compared the storytelling in films to storytelling in video games. In it he says, With video games, we are right now still in that first wave of creators, critics, and readers, who are asking questions like, What story is the gameplay telling? This was in a video of his from a few years ago regarding the metaphorical Jabberwocky in video game criticism, Luder Narrative Dissonance. This video isn't entirely about Luder Narrative Dissonance, but rather its counterpart, Luder Narrative Harmony. The Luder Narrative Harmony concept has been floating around for a while now. Basically, it's when the mechanics or tools at the player's disposal work in conjunction with the narrative of the game. There is never a true sense of harmony in many games, though. Some say it's actually impossible to achieve pure harmony. Some games, however, can be pretty damn close. The studio behind Disco Elysium, Zom Studios, won four awards at the Game Awards last year in 2019 for Best Narrative, Best Role-Playing Game, Best Debut Indie Game, and Best Independent Game, winning two more awards at the New York Game Awards and Outstanding Achievement in Story at the DICE Awards. And on top of that, while writing this script, it won three BAFTA awards. That's a fuckload of awards. And so, why has it won so many? To me, it's because this game takes an enormous leap towards Ludo narrative harmony in a CRPG. This is a game that has built a role-playing system that allows the player to fully explore the world they're in and navigate the psyche of the main character. And at the same time, these mechanics couple with how the story is told through a player-driven experience. Now you can see why I might be paying close attention to this game. There are many elements of Disco Elysium storytelling and role-playing mechanics that need breaking down in order to take away the fragments and learn from them. What is the core reason behind the mechanics? What did the world building achieve? What does being a cop do for the narrative? And as always, what can video game developers learn from it? Grab yourself a bottle of Commodore Red, put on your disco shoes and feel the groove as we dance into the realm of the surreal the melancholic and scientific communism. This is the complete narrative breakdown of Disco Elysium. Welcome to Ravishol. In most RPGs, I enjoy the cities and the areas of the world that I am exploring. Rarely, though, do I feel as immersed as I did in a city like Ravishol. The great city of Ravishol is more than just a backdrop for our journey in this game. It is the beating heart which produces the characters we interact with and creates the melancholic atmosphere for Harry's journey. According to the wiki for Disco Elysium, Ravishol is a city of contrasts, which is an apt description of the situation when you enter the game. While we are confined to the district of Martinez within the city, the game's dialogue and information we gather allows us to piece together the world beyond it and the point of history we emerge into. The environment allows you to gather information in a variety of ways, other than the usual way, such as NPC dialogue, most times it involves noticing something around you and inspecting it, upon which usually one of your many attributes chime in like a shard of your consciousness. It can mention the significance of whatever you've interacted with or relay some piece of information only the relevant skill can provide. Having that reaction from your character based on your skills is something that frees the writing in this game of one of the sinful components of world building, the dreaded info dump. This is also helped with the character's perspective of waking up from an epic bender with psychotraumatic amnesia, but we'll get to that. Depending on your interpretation of these inner dialogues, these interactions allow the narrative to flow more in a quippy back and forth manner rather than creating a chunky wall of text whenever you click on an interactable. It also adds more intrigue to whatever you find, seeing as different skills mean different inner dialogues to elucidate different information of the world. The prime suspect in giving you the background of the world building as you play this game is the Encyclopedia skill. This skill is the telltale facet of the main character's catalogue of facts and material knowledge of the world around him. 
This skill isn't necessary to gather essential information from the world, but can provide background encyclopedic facts on objects, events, people, and areas of the world. It's a neat idea. Some RPGs try to do this by throwing in books you find throughout the world that explain some obtuse facet of the world. While I myself do like reading these books and engage in the world in this way, having a skill that prompts this is much more streamlined and allows the gameplay, world building, and story to flow in sync. Before going on, we need to talk about the start of the story. Your character, Harry, or as I insisted to be referred to as, Raphael Ambrosius Costo, wakes up with alcohol-induced blackout amnesia when you start the game, after a serious bender the night before. The narrative tool of the uninformed perspective of the protagonist works in tandem with the need to explore and have interactions to explain what you observe in the game. Without the amnesia, a world like the one in Disco Elysium would have been hard to immerse the player in. With the amnesia also, players can see how intricate and lovingly built up the history and culture is within Ravishol. But we'll get to that in another section in more detail. Let's talk more about the world. Without a doubt, this game doesn't dance around modern political theories, nor does it try to portray certain ones as the right one. With any good world building, the political threads of the world are weaved into characters to show how it shapes them and the world around them. It's not by accident that Harry can observe areas around Martinez that look like they've been hit by artillery shells, even drawing more attention to it when NPCs play a ball game in a crater caused by cannon fire. History has left scars on the people and on the city itself. I think Robert Kurvitz, the lead writer and designer of this game, has a vast understanding of history and manages to create an analogue of what maybe he sees the current clashes of political ideologies of our world and what it does to people. These are echoes of events like those similar in Estonia in the early 20th century and the days after the October Revolution in Russia. Personally, I think the writers, including Kurvitz, have understood a golden maxim of some forms of historical analysis. History does not exactly repeat itself, but it has rhythms. The city of Ravishol has a very rich history of struggle and political clashes. The main timeline seems to start when the communists oppose a monarchy. Following this, an allied coalition of centrist and con nations come in and establish a very recognizable system. The purpose of including this rich history has a clear purpose. Most of the NPCs that you meet are heavily influenced by these events. Some people adhere to ideologies that you agree or disagree with, or these past events become a part of the characters and imbue them with beliefs or mannerisms in a very overt way. Out loud, this sort of seems pretty typical for a CRPG, right? In particular, the most immediate and relevant example I can think of is Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire. In some cases though, in Deadfire, the character writing leans on their politics, opinions, and backgrounds way too much. Disco Elysium though, to me, achieves that balance of showing individuality of characters, but retaining that influence from the world building. The most notable example that doesn't spoil too much is the character René Arnaud. He is a decorated veteran soldier from the days of the monarchy, or the suzerain, and even still wears his colourful uniform with pride while playing an average ball game with his friend. When you interact with him, he will always call back to the good old days of the monarch Frizzle I, and with successful checks, you can even get him to reveal his heroic story of saving the spoiled brat heir. The point here is, he's a fascist. The man relishes the idea of an autocratic, ostentatious, shouty man to guide the nation. For most people, player or NPC alike, he's considered reprehensible and a disagreeable character. But for me, while I did dislike him, I also felt bad for him. He was once a proud soldier, who believed he had an iron, unbending purpose in life, who was honoured by his fellow patriots when he put his life on the line for the monarchy. The one constant thing in his world slowly crumbled away under the revolution. He was powerless, and all that gave him pride was taken from him. He was never able to recover from this clearly, he was stuck in the past. Stuck believing that time in his life was the only time the world made sense, and he has limped on ever since. Near the end of the game, you find his arch nemesis and friend Gaston mourning René, who has just died of a heart attack. When you ask him how he felt before René dies, he says, We've hated each other our entire lives. 
But yes, I... I loved that angry prick. He didn't deserve it, but I did. He says that Renee's last words were, In Guillaume's time, you'd have been shot without a trial. Saying that he lived a cunt, he died a cunt. Let's leave it at that. The tendrils of fascism might not be a barrier to human affection, but it does cast a shadow over it. This to me demonstrates perfectly how the politics of Ravishol have shaped the people within it and tells so much about how people become who they are. Another important thing in the world building is the fact that Ravishol is still feeling the effects of a revolution even after five decades. The ideologies of communism, fascism, ultra-liberalism, and moralism are one of the four political stances you can adopt throughout the game. You don't necessarily select these stats as if you would be um, selecting a stat, like picking an alignment like lawful good or chaotic neutral. Instead, depending on certain choices you make throughout the game, most of the time the dialogue options that signify certain political stances are written quite explicitly, except for the stance of moralism, in which any dialogue choice where you say, I have no stance on this matter, usually gives you a point as a moralist. So, moralism is basically coded as neoliberalism, which I found quite funny, to be honest. I love how the world building and the storytelling have overlapped here. The influences of the world's politics and the player interacting with them in the narrative is a neat way for the player to not only add another level of complexity to Harry in gameplay terms, but also assess the player's own set of real life values. However, I'm sure not every player takes the political stance as a true representation of their own beliefs. It's what the player brings to the ideology, and the characters in the story react to whatever the player has chosen. The game does not force one particular ideology as the right one or tax it on as an ideology for you to follow for the entire game, emphasizing values rather than an in-game objective system of universal morality. Not only does this mechanic allow the player to have a greater sense of agency with guiding Harry through his journey, but also it continues to drive home this sense of how the world shapes characters, even the protagonist. But as mentioned, it doesn't remove agency of the player to achieve this. More importantly, the character building mechanic blends with aspects of gameplay as well, which we'll discuss later. The game setting is something that is truly unique, but at the end of the day, in this never-ending language game we all play, there's always a name for new things. I dug through some of the old devlogs and found this neat description of the setting back in 2016. The game is set in a time of Cold War in a world that never was. Replace the futuristic science elements and sci-fi with modernity and you get... Modernopunk? A world of Bauhaus and Dada, neo-grotesque fonts and transistors, communists and fascists and boring old democracies. Off the coast you can occasionally spot airbound coalition ships keeping the peace. They are kept afloat with magnetic levitation. Further, beyond the horizon there is the pale that divides the continents. I know this might be a joke, sort of taking the piss, but to be honest, I think Modernopunk might be the most sensible and encapsulating word for this game's setting. In many instances though, the setting of Disco Elysium is dystopian in some way. The post-revolution society, strange, unfamiliar technology and socio-economic disparity. But it didn't fit certain requirements for, say, cyberpunk, like a radical futuristic core technology that completely reshapes human life as we know it. However it be that the genre is becoming frighteningly similar to certain aspects of the current world we live in. For clarification, I believe it's safe to say that modernopunk and cyberpunk fall under the umbrella of the dystopian genre. What separates them, though, is the subjective. What are the game's themes, the core development arcs with characters, and more importantly, what is it critiquing? Certain genres of dystopian fiction can tell different stories. So why was it so important that I break down the setting and the world building within this game? Why do I need to give this game setting a definition or why did I discuss the politics affecting characters? It is because once we give names to the feelings we get when we play video games, the more we can communicate about it and further our understanding of the medium of video games itself. I think that the act of world building is also a rigorous exercise of creativity and displays understandings of human culture, societies, and life itself. But also, for me, it's just plain fun to talk about this stuff. I'm a pleasure-seeking creature, just like you. 
Whatever reason other critics or essayists may give for their 45 minute uh, video essays on the meaning of cyberpunk or how shitty the final season of Game of Thrones was, we do it because it's fun. People create worlds for games like Disco Elysium because it's fun. In the words of Detective Kim Kitsuragi, some people really like building a world, I think, even if it's just for a game. So let's enjoy ourselves as we become immersed in another world, even for just a few hours, to try at life again. Disillusionment in the discotheque. One thing you'll no doubt experience as you wander through Martinez is a sense of disillusionment and cynicism in the people that live there. The city of Ravishol is still reeling from the effects of a revolution from more than 50 years ago. It's not just the writing that achieves this though, but the music as well. The soundtrack was composed by British Sea Power, and it communicates in many of its tracks the right feeling of desolation and loneliness. I don't know if this is, you know, actually a connection or just a co coincidence. But as I was finding music to listen to as I was writing this script, I came across a genre called Soviet Wave that reminded me of some of the tracks within Disco Elysium. If you're not familiar, this genre of music is a lo-fi synth-pop blend of electronica that carries tones of longing and bittersweet melodies. This music emerged in its original form shortly after the fall of the USSR and made its way to YouTube by various artists in the 2010s. The music genre is tied to the general aesthetic of retrofuturism, usually visual, but in this case it's audio form, and the art depicts promises of, say, a future from a previous era within a nation. When seen or heard today, it brings about bittersweet feelings of the future that never came, or a disconnection to an ephemeral utopia. In this case, it is the Soviet Russia brand of it. American retrofuturism aesthetic is seen, however, in games such as The Outer Worlds and the Fallout series. I don't know if the particular elements of musical composition of Soviet Wave were inspirational for the music or whatever, but the fact that I get the same feeling of loneliness and hopelessness with the bittersweet synth-pop tunes and some of the tracks in Disco Elysium, it tells me a lot about the potential effect this music could have in the game's setting. In fact, I think even the references to disco music is something to be discussed. According to some articles I've read, during the existence of the USSR, disco music was very popular during the 70s and 80s. Which honestly surprised me, considering it's the USSR. This makes a bit of difference as the aforementioned Soviet wave music does have elements of disco in it. In fact, the disco scene originated mainly originated from the Baltic nations, like Estonia. The discotheques were one of the main outlets for fun for the youth of the USSR. Having a quest in the game that revolves around a group of youths trying to start a, a dance club in Martinez, again, demonstrates the importance of music, be that the anodic dance music or disco music within the world itself. Throughout the game as well, people refer to Harry's obsession with disco music as odd, saying it's old and weird for someone to still be into disco as much as he is. But Harry's iconic look says that he's still carrying a flame for something that died long ago, and how everyone else has moved on. This to me further overlaps with that feeling of disillusionment people are experiencing in the game. British Sea Power communicated the feelings of disillusionment in a world that has changed too much for some people. It's just spot on for the world that the developers have created and the stories that the game tells. Especially how Harry is dealing with the existential terror of things that he's lost. I'm curious what the music in Disco Elysium has done for you, dear viewer, if you have another interpretation of it. Um, feel free to comment as always. The music in Disco Elysium achieved another layer of world building. Something to me that is often overlooked in some other reviews. Reinforcing more of the emotional, subjective elements for the setting of the game. You're a cop, Harry. You wake up from an epic bender to a world that is utterly unfamiliar to you. You don't know your name, or even what money is. When you head downstairs, a thin man with thick glasses and an orange bomber jacket reveals to you that you are, in fact, a police officer of the Ravishol Citizen Militia. And from there, the real story begins. An amnesiac as a protagonist in any narrative, be that video game, novel, or film, is a way to bestow the uninformed perspective onto the protagonist, in this case, controlled by the player. Disco Elysium uses the amnesia device in a clever way. For clarity, 
Amnesia has been conceived in many different forms in video game narratives. In other stories, the character wakes up from a long sleep, they awaken from a terrible accident, or they were taken away by the wild hunt for a few years. I don't think Amnesia is necessarily a token of bad writing. It can, however, be used for the wrong reasons, and more importantly, can be done badly. In most cases, when the amnesia is used as a means to drive the plot rather than develop character, it can come off as cheesy, tiresome, or contrived. The amnesia needs to have nuance and drive character development, not create thin excuses for plot development. A good example of an amnesiac protagonist in a narrative-driven RPG is Planescape Torment. The amnesiac nature of the Nameless One, the protagonist, is an immortal who has his memory wiped whenever he dies. The story in Planescape Torment is not about forging a new character from a blank slate, but rather discovering the lives you've lived in the past. So then, the amnesia is central to the character's struggle within the world they're in. The player then is allowed to derive meaning from these previous lives, pursue these experiences, or reinvent themselves. Something that is deeply connected to the reason why amnesia works in Disco Elysium. The amnesia Harry experiences in the game is self-inflicted, which gives us a window to the sort of character he is. The amnesia is not a blank slate to pave the way for a plot, but rather granting a sense of agency onto the player to shape Harry's past rather than make it your own character. The amnesia brings you further into Harry's character by interacting with the game's dialogue system and understanding the effect your choices have in the game. It also helps that Harry is a detective, which infers that he has a sharp perception and is capable of above average levels of human interaction with others, cognition, and that he can manipulate the world around him. A detective is a tool of a necessary aspect of modern society, justice. It's a very relatable and powerful thing to have agency over in a video game. The detective has become something of a mythical figure in recent times, but the detective also has become the lens in modern society that allows people to traverse the world of the abnormal. I'm not just talking about abnormal like monsters or squid creatures from the realm of Raelia, but from the realm of the criminal. The mind of a criminal belongs into a sub-realm of society that not many of us have the chance to delve into. So then, the detectives, or citizen militia in this case, are endowed with abilities to explore the realm of the abnormal. Not just because of their physical and mental abilities, but the detective can traverse the necessary class or faction system that is established in the society of the world you're playing in. In some variation, games have adapted the detective trope into their protagonists such as Pillars of Eternity series, with the powers of the Watcher being somewhat similar, albeit in a metaphysical sense, to that of a police detective. As a detective in Disco Elysium, Harry's attributes and skills are intellect, psyche, physique, and motorics. However, the interesting stuff gets to the skills that correspond with these attributes. For example, the ones that correspond to motorics are hand-eye coordination, perception, reaction speed, savoir-faire, interfacing, and composure. Each of these skills have applications in your investigations, as well as a means to interact with the world in general. These skills work harmoniously as a narrative device, as well as with gameplay. I think one reason why that this is the case is because resolving conflict in Disco Elysium is not a plain dichotomy of combat or diplomacy. Traditional combat we've come to expect in video games has become something that is ingrained in the medium to be the main mode of progressing in skill and masterfulness. Games without combat get informally treated as an entirely different genre. In Disco Elysium, conflict arises in the difficult in achieving necessary tasks with the tools you've been given. Let's take an example. Early in the game, the owner of the hostel you're staying in may confront you about the damage done to the room you've rented. One of the game's only options it gives you is to run away. Passing a savoir-faire check successfully allows you to run for the door and avoid the confrontation entirely. This act has lasting repercussions in the later instances. The hostel owner references your act of fleeing and you're granted a new branch of dialogue. One thing I've mentioned in my video for Pillars of Eternity 2 is the ludonarrative concept of multi-faceted diplomacy. 
a dialogue structure that favours many avenues to diplomacy in dialogue rather than just one sole stat or skill. Needless to say, Disco Elysium is an exemplary demonstration of this tool in the storytelling. The developers of the game were able to really subdivide and examine every aspect of traditional RPG diplomacy into these skills like uh, reaction speed, empathy, rhetoric, and so on. The diplomacy side of this game weighs heavily on all the stats you select, not just buffing one or two skills on your character. This skill system allows a variety of ways for you to advance through the main plot. I've done two playthroughs. In both, I advanced differently by getting different pieces of evidence at different points and encountered different challenges regarding the in murder investigation. Upon reflection, for analytical purposes, it was entirely necessary for me to do two playthroughs. With these playthroughs, I saw how each playstyle you adopt brings about radically different experiences. While yes, the same plot plays out, there are several ways the story changes. Characters react differently to you, the investigation pipeline is different. To me it shows how plot in any story is the skeleton that supports the overall narrative. The story that players get has an amorphous nature depending on the choices and skill checks you manage to pass. When a story forms around the gameplay, that is the core goal of what a video game RPG should strive to do. Disco Elysium does this in such a pure way. There has always been a creative dichotomy in video games between its gameplay and its narrative. We can have games with riveting story but the gameplay combat is dull, or games with terrible story but exciting gameplay. Games rarely find that harmony between the two. Disco Elysium has taken a place along the promenade of video games that have achieved a semblance of unity between gameplay and narrative by de-emphasizing traditional RPG combat and allowed nuanced ways of generating conflict through its skill and attribute system. There is one more system we need to discuss that has a huge role in the gameplay and the story. Enter the Thought Cabinet. Many RPGs have an ancillary passive system that supports your stats or skills like feats, quirks, perks, whatever the name is, whatever it is. Its purpose is to support the main character stats and help refine the character build you're going for. Never did I think that game developers could create a system that reinforces the character's decisions made within the story so well. That system is the Thought Cabinet. Unlike traditional stat systems, the thought is acquired through moments in gameplay dependent on decisions, all made with successful skill checks. There is then another layer to it. Each thought has a temporary and finished status. Once activated, it provides a displayed set of bonuses. After it's finished researching though, the bonuses change. Sometimes depending on your build, it can be a detriment to you, making you assess risk versus reward situations for that thought. You're forced to ask yourself, what thoughts should I equip? And more importantly, why? Do you select, say, Mesovian socioeconomics because you want to be a red flag waving communist ranting about chains and class struggle, or do you like the bonuses it grants you? It's also important to note that the thoughts you equip grant you additional dialogue choices in certain interactions. Equipping one of these thoughts has such meaning and importance to your character, and the story you play through it's a reactive feature to the RPG system and it's not entirely in the player's control. Through the gameplay, it creates a feedback loop to affect your character and reinforce that feeling of how your decisions and actions in this game, they're made to feel significant. Similar systems include the humanity system from Vampire Masquerade Bloodlines and the flaw system in The Outer Worlds. The humanity system from Vampire Masquerade is more on par with what I'm discussing here as it reinforces the storytelling of the game while the floor system in Outer Worlds more creates interesting scenarios in combat related gameplay. It doesn't necessarily affect dialogue and storytelling as far as I know. Sometimes we as players need more systems in place that help to form not only our statistical build in a game, but also our identity. Because to me, that is something RPGs allow us to do, create new identities. The thought system in Disco Elysium allows us to create a tableau of the many facets of a psyche that forms the complex personality of, in this case, Harry Dubois. But who is Harry Dubois? And more importantly, what does this story mean to us? The Pale Cometh I love Disco Elysium so much, 
because it wasn't afraid to wander into the realms of philosophical darkness and ask harsh, disheartening questions. What does it take to move on? Do memories of what once strengthened us now cripple us? We play this game through a character who is in the midst of a midlife crisis. We're in, we're in a world trapped in the past, not willing to move forward. And we don't know what world we've woken up in. As you play, you most likely begin to see a definite theme of struggle. Be that the class struggle displayed in the revolution and the mental struggle within Harry. In my two playthroughs of Disco Elysium, I played as the logical sorry cop and the swift, powerful superstar cop in the other. In my second playthrough, I noticed something interesting. The two playthroughs had radically different experiences for me that reminded me of Nietzsche's theory of the Apollonian and the Dionysian dialectic seen in his works of The Birth of Tragedy. In my first playthrough, I breezed through mental interactions with ease. I overcame many of the mental interactions with, the, with ease and I breezed through the um, logical deduction of the investigation. I unlocked the hidden beauty of the world, but I felt unable to explore the world physically. I was also sadder and, well, more repressed. I was Apollo, the light, the champion of rational thinking. But then I played the superstar cop, and while the investigation was not as smooth as I may have liked, I, I had lots of fun. I laughed out loud at times, I explored the world, connected with people. I felt that I was more in control. I felt freer. But others saw me as dangerous and unhinged. Much like Dionysus, I was this uncontrollable aspect of human nature. This dialectic was core to Harry's own struggle. Harry struggles with what others expect him to be and what he really desires. This no doubt is a theme within the writing that is linked back to the philosophy collectively known as existentialism. That the meaning we seek in life is actually bestowed onto life itself by us. Our existence defines the meaning we seek. Noticing these things in Disco Elysium makes me think that the writers, such as Robert Kurvitz, are knowledgeable of certain philosophies. Considering people from Zom Studios thanked Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels for their political education at their acceptance speech, to me demonstrates their thorough understanding of the evolution of philosophical ideas, such as materialism, existentialism, and even postmodernism. I think the core wound of the Revacholian people and of Harry Dubois is a refusal to accept change, or the inability to look forward rather than backward. The world of Elysium, and in particular the history of Ravishol, is mired in aggrandizing the past. This to me is demonstrated really well in the climax of the game when the murderer is revealed to you. Through them, we're given a glimpse to the world that they existed in. A world of fiery hope with a bright future. When you meet them, they say that there is no flame to fan, there is nothing left of the world or our dreams. A character that simply couldn't move on from what they thought was promised to them. They beg for a chance to die so they could finally give up the fight for their ideology. This to me communicated a common thread amongst some of the characters, like Rene Arnaud, of a person trapped in the past. Harry is trapped in the past, unable to reconcile with that horrible event that happened years ago. People can look to their current state of affairs and make conclusions as to what the solution is. Even from the same observation, each person can produce one within hundreds of excuses or reasons to pinpoint exactly why their society is the way it is. Human knowledge is immutable and universal. Therefore, the foil lies within its translation. The story gives us fuel for the thought that maybe the ideals of the past are nothing to strive for, because maybe they were wrong, and what they imagined as this bygone utopia is simply gone. Who could live in such a state, knowing that the peak of their life is just gone forever? So does the story tell us anything about how to maybe avoid this pit of despair? Maybe. Maybe like Harry, you can reinvent yourself, like he does. Perhaps you don't need to go on a three day bender, but let's say you can wake up one morning and forget the regrets, the missed opportunities, and embrace now. Be a superstar, be a fancy art cop, be a cop of the apocalypse, become anything. As long as you're moving forward, that's what matters most. It reminds me of something the Danish existentialist philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said, life 
can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Disco Elysium has stayed away from having a bombastic epic story, be that of a space opera or a fight against the evil overlord, and tells a much more relatable story. A story within a modern society that gives us a new perspective in life. But more importantly, it's a great video game. So let's recap of what elements made it so. While your characters shouldn't be direct personifications of certain ideologies of your world, connecting those ideologies to emotionally resonate with the character is a great way to build your characters and make the history or society of the world feel more tangible. The composition of the music to relay key, pervasive feelings within the setting creates a lot of the subjective and emotional elements of a setting for players. Don't always write off amnesia as bad writing. Remember that the distinction between a poorly written video game protagonist and a good one is for the amnesia to be intrinsic or to some core aspect of the character, rather than the purpose of revealing plot developments and shocking twists. You don't necessarily need to make your protagonist a detective in an RPG, but having them in a position of being able to explore the abnormal realms of your world will give the player a sense of wonder and empowerment. Multifaceted diplomacy is a great narrative tool to give players a variety of ways to succeed in dialogue interactions in your RPG. Think of new mechanical ways for players to control a conversation or ways to resolve conflict other than fighting or simple persuasion. The reactivity of the world to the player is key to making the game a unique experience for them. Try to find ways that the in-game characters will react to the player's decisions, even in the smallest ways. This will also add to the replayability factor of your game. A stat system that reflects choices and dialogue and builds the player's constructed personality of their character is a great system to implement for all future RPGs. And lastly, I think I'll add that Using elements of real-world philosophy such as existentialism in games is something this medium really needs. I personally think that the world would um, be a bit of a better place if we were introduced to helpful philosophies in meaningful and immersive ways, such as video games. If I were to describe the story of Disco Elysium to someone in a somewhat flowery way, I would say that the game is exploring the pain of never moving on. All throughout the game, we deal with Harry's inability to accept the past and deal with what lays ahead of him. To quote Kierkegaard again, he states that the most painful state of being is remembering the future, particularly the one you'll never have. So let's all move forward, go headlong into the pale and dance to the tune of whatever life gives us. Like, comment, subscribe, do all that lovely stuff down below. Thank you for watching this video. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to discuss down below your thoughts on Disco Elysium. I would love to read the comments. And yes, this has been a huge passion project for me. I really hope you enjoyed it. I put a lot of, I put a lot of hard work into this. Be sure to share this video with your mates and I'll catch you later.